Good evening, and welcome to Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's installment provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep for once. So lie back, adjust your volume, take a nice deep breath, and off we go. This evening we're relaxing with a true classic of science, the sidereal messenger of Galileo Galilei, and a part of the preface to Kepler's Dioptrix, containing the original account of Galileo's astronomical discoveries. A translation with introduction and notes by Edward Stafford Carlos, M.A., head mathematical master in Christ's Hospital, Rivington's Waterloo Place, London, 1880. Let's begin. Prefatory Note About five years ago, I was engaged in preparing a catalog of the ancient books which belonged to Christ's Hospital. One portion of these books consisted of a collection of ancient mathematical works, presented at various times for the use of that part of the school, which is known as the Royal Mathematical Foundation of King Charles II. Amongst them were some well known by name to every mathematical student, but which few have ever seen. Perhaps the most interesting of them all was a little volume, printed in London in 1653, containing Gassendi's explanation of the Ptolemaic and Copernican systems of astronomy, as well as that of Tycho Brahe, Galileo's Sidereus Nuncius, and Kepler's Dioptrix. I found Galileo's account of his astronomical discoveries so interesting, both in matter and in style, that I translated it as a recreation from schoolwork. I venture to think that others also will be interested in following Galileo through the apprehension of his famous discoveries, and in reading the language in which he announced them. Introduction In 1609, Galileo, then professor of mathematics at Padua, in the service of the Venetian Republic, heard from a correspondent at Paris of the invention of a telescope and set to work to consider how such an instrument could be made. The result was his invention of the telescope known by his name, and identical in principle with the modern opera glass. In a maritime and warlike state, the advantages to be expected from such an invention were immediately recognized, and Galileo was rewarded with a confirmation of his professorship for life and a handsome stipend in recognition of his invention and construction of the first telescope seen at Venice. In his pamphlet, The Sidereal Messenger, here translated, Galileo relates how he came to learn the value of the telescope for astronomical research, and how his observations were rewarded by numerous discoveries in rapid succession, and at length by that of Jupiter's satellites. Galileo at once saw the value of this discovery as bearing upon the establishment of the Copernican system of astronomy, which had met with slight acceptance, and indeed as yet had hardly any recommendation except that of greater simplicity. Kepler had just published at Prague his work on the planet Mars, Commentaria de Motibus Stelle Martis, on which he had been engaged apparently for eight years. There he heard of Galileo's discoveries, and at length was invited by Galileo himself through a common friend, Giuliano de' Medici, ambassador of the Grand Duke of Tuscany, Cosmo de' Medici II, to the Emperor Rudolf II, to correspond with Galileo on the subject of these discoveries. The Emperor also requested his opinion, and Kepler accordingly examined Galileo's sidereal messenger in a pamphlet entitled A Discussion with the Sidereal Messenger, Florence, 1610. In this discussion, Kepler gives reasons for accepting Galileo's observations, although he was not able to verify them from want of a telescope, and entirely supports Galileo's views and conclusions, adducing his own previous speculations, 
or pointing out, as in the case of Galileo's idea of earth light on the moon, the previous conception of the same explanation of the phenomenon. Kepler ends by expressing unbounded enthusiasm at the discovery of Jupiter's satellites and the argument it furnishes in support of the Copernican theory. Soon after, in 1611, Kepler published another pamphlet, his Narrative, giving an account of actual observations made in verification of Galileo's discoveries by himself and several friends whose names he gives with a telescope made by Galileo and belonging to Ernest, a lector and archbishop of Cologne. Kepler and his friends saw the lunar mountains and three of the satellites of Jupiter, but failed to make out any signs of the ring of Saturn corresponding to the imperfect description of Galileo. Kepler had previously published a treatise on optics, Frankfurt, 1604. He now extended it to the consideration of the theory of the telescope and explained the principle of Galileo's telescope. He also showed another combination of lenses which would produce a similar effect. This was the principle of the common astronomical telescope, often called from this circumstance Kepler's telescope, though he did not construct it. The account of Galileo's later astronomical discoveries of Saturn's ring and the phases of Venus is taken from the preface of this work. Kepler's Dioptrics, Augsburg, 1611. In 1612, Galileo published a series of observations of solar spots, and in 1618, some observations of three comets. There exist also long series of minute observations of Jupiter and his satellites, continued to November 1619. Galileo's Works, Florence, 1845. Further astronomical researches may have been hindered by failing sight. One more astronomical discovery, however, that of the moon's librations, was made as late as 1637. Galileo died January 8, 1642. The following editions have been used for the translation. Galileo's Works 1. Florence, 1718 2. Padua, 1744 3. Florence, 1842-1856 to Siderius Nuncius 1. Venice, 1610 2. London, 1653 Kepler's Works Edited C. Frisch, Frankfurt, 1858-1871 The Sidereal Messenger Unfolding great and marvelous sights and proposing them to the attention of everyone but especially philosophers and astronomers, being such as have been observed by Galileo Galilei, a gentleman of Florence, professor of mathematics in the University of Padua, with the aid of a telescope lately invented by him, respecting the moon's surface, an innumerable number of fixed stars, the Milky Way and nebulous stars, but especially respecting four planets which revolve around the planet Jupiter at different distances and in different periodic times with amazing velocity, and which, after remaining unknown to everyone up to this day, the author recently discovered and determined to name the Medicean stars. Venice, 1610 To the most serene, Cosmo de Medici II, fourth Grand Duke of Tuscany. There is certainly something very noble and large-minded in the intention of those who have endeavored to protect from envy the noble achievements of distinguished men, and to rescue their names worthy of immortality from oblivion and decay. This desire has given us the lineaments of famous men sculptured in marble or fashioned in bronze as a memorial of them to future ages. 
to the same feeling we owe the erection of statues, both ordinary and equestrian. Hence, as the poet says, has originated expenditure, mounting to the stars, upon columns and pyramids. With this desire, lastly, cities have been built and distinguished by the names of those men, whom the gratitude of posterity thought worthy of being handed down to all ages. For the state of the human mind is such that unless it be continually stirred by the counterparts of matters, obtruding themselves upon it from without, all recollection of the matters easily passes away from it. But others, having regard for more stable and more lasting monuments, secured the eternity of the fame of great men by placing it under the protection, not of marble or bronze, but of the muses' guardianship and the imperishable monuments of literature. But why do I mention these things, as if human wit, content with these regions, did not dare to advance further? Whereas, since she well understood that all human monuments do perish at last by violence, by weather, or by age, she took a wider view and invented more imperishable signs, over which destroying time and envious age could claim no rights. So, betaking herself to the sky, she inscribed on the well-known orbs of the brightest stars, those everlasting orbs, the names of those who, for eminent and godlike deeds, were accounted worthy to enjoy an eternity in company with the stars. Wherefore, the fame of Jupiter, Mars, Mercury, Hercules, and the rest of the heroes by whose names the stars are called, will not fade until the extinction of the splendor of the constellations themselves. But this invention of human shrewdness, so particularly noble and admirable, has gone out of date ages ago, inasmuch as primeval heroes are in possession of those bright abodes, and keep them by a sort of right, into whose company the affection of Augustus in vain attempted to introduce Julius Caesar, for when he wished that the name of the Julian constellation should be given to a star, which appeared in his time, one of those which the Greeks and the Latins alike name from their hair-like tails, comets. It vanished in a short time and mocked his too eager hope. But we are able to read the heavens for your highness, most serene prince, far more truly and more happily, for scarcely have the immortal graces of your mind begun to shine on earth when bright stars present themselves in the heavens like tongues to tell and celebrate your most surpassing virtues to all time. Behold, therefore, four stars reserved for your famous name, and those not belonging to the common and less conspicuous multitude of fixed stars, but in the bright ranks of the planets. Four stars which, moving differently from each other round the planet Jupiter, the most glorious of all the planets, as if they were his own children, accomplish the courses of their orbits with marvelous velocity, while all the while with one accord they complete altogether mighty revolutions every ten years round the center of the universe, that is, round the sun. But the maker of the stars himself seemed to direct me by clear reasons to assign these new planets to the famous name of your highness, in preference to all others. For just as these stars, like children worthy of their sire, never leave the side of Jupiter by any appreciable distance, so who does not know that clemency, kindness of heart, gentleness of manners, splendor of royal blood, nobleness in public functions, wide extent of influence and power over others, all of which have fixed their common abode and seat in your highness. Who, I say, does not know that all these qualities, according to the providence of God, from whom all good things do come, emanate from the benign star of Jupiter. Jupiter, Jupiter, I maintain, at the instant of the birth of your highness, having at length emerged from the turbid mists of the horizon, and being in possession of the middle quarter of the heavens, 
and illuminating the eastern angle from his own royal house, from that exalted throne, looked out upon your most happy birth and poured forth into a most pure atmosphere all the brightness of his majesty in order that your tender body and your mind, though that was already adorned by God with still more splendid graces, might imbibe with your first breath the whole of that influence and power. But why should I use only plausible arguments when I can almost absolutely demonstrate my conclusion? It was the will of Almighty God that I should be judged by your most serene parents not unworthy to be employed in teaching your highness mathematics, which duty I discharged during the four years just past, at that time of the year when it is customary to take a relaxation from severer studies. Wherefore, since it evidently fell to my lot by God's will to serve your highness, and so to receive the rays of your surpassing clemency and beneficence in a position near your person. What wonder is it if you have so warmed my heart that it thinks about scarcely anything else day and night, but how I, who am indeed your subject not only by inclination, but also by my very birth and lineage, may be known to be most anxious for your glory and most grateful to you. And so, inasmuch as under your patronage, most serene Cosmo, I have discovered these stars which were unknown to all astronomers before me, I have, with very good right, determined to designate them with the most august name of your family. And as I was the first to investigate them, who can rightly blame me if I give them a name and call them the Medicean Stars? hoping that as much consideration may accrue to these stars from this title as other stars have brought to other heroes. For not to speak of your most serene ancestors, to whose everlasting glory the monuments of all history bear witness, your virtue alone, most mighty sire, can confer on those stars an immortal name. For who can doubt that you will not only maintain and preserve the expectations, high though they be about yourself, which you have aroused by the very happy beginning of your government, but that you will also far surpass them, so that when you have conquered others like yourself, you may still vie with yourself and become day by day greater than yourself and your greatness. Accept then, most clement prince, this addition to the glory of your family, reserved by the stars for you. And may you enjoy for many years those good blessings which are sent to you not so much from the stars as from God, the maker and governor of the stars. Your Highness's most devoted servant, Galileo Galilei, Padua, March 12, 1610. The Astronomical Messenger containing and setting forth observations lately made with the aid of a newly invented telescope respecting the moon's surface, the Milky Way, nebulous stars, an innumerable multitude of fixed stars, and also respecting four planets never before seen, which have been named the Cosmian stars. In the present small treatise, I set forth some matters of great interest for all observers of natural phenomena to look at and consider. They are of great interest, I think, first from their intrinsic excellence, second from their absolute novelty, and lastly also on account of the instrument by the aid of which they have been presented to my apprehension. The number of the fixed stars which observers have been able to see without artificial powers of sight up to this day can be counted. It is therefore decidedly a great feat to add to their number, and to set distinctly before the eyes other stars in myriads which have never been seen before, and which surpass the old previously known stars in number more than ten times. Again, it is a most beautiful and delightful sight to behold the body of the moon, which is distant from us nearly 60 semi-diameters of the earth, 
as near as if it was at a distance of only two of the same measures, so that the diameter of this same moon appears about 30 times larger, its surface about 900 times, and its solid mass nearly 27,000 times larger than when it is viewed only with the naked eye. And consequently, any one may know with the certainty that is due to the use of our senses that the moon certainly does not possess a smooth and polished surface, but one rough and uneven, and just like the face of the earth itself, is everywhere full of vast protuberances, deep chasms, and sinuosities. Then, to have got rid of disputes about the galaxy or Milky Way, and to have made its nature clear to the very senses, not to say to the understanding, seems by no means a matter which ought to be considered of slight importance. In addition to this, to point out, as with one's finger, the nature of those stars which every one of the astronomers up to this time has called nebulous, and to demonstrate that it is very different from what has hitherto been believed, will be pleasant and very fine. But that which will excite the greatest astonishment by far, and which indeed especially moved me to call the attention of all astronomers and philosophers, is this, namely, that I have discovered four planets, neither known nor observed by any one of the astronomers before my time, which have their orbits round a certain bright star, one of those previously known, like Venus and Mercury round the sun, and are sometimes in front of it, sometimes behind it, though they never depart from it beyond certain limits. All which facts were discovered and observed a few days ago by the help of a telescope devised by me, through God's grace first enlightening my mind. Perchance other discoveries still more excellent will be made from time to time by me or by other observers, with the assistance of a similar instrument so I will first briefly record its shape and preparation, as well as the occasion of its being devised, and then I will give an account of the observations made by me. About ten months ago, a report reached my ears that a Dutchman had constructed a telescope, by the aid of which visible objects, although at a great distance from the eye of the observer, were seen distinctly as if near and some proofs of its most wonderful performances were reported, which some gave credence to, but others contradicted. A few days after, I received confirmation of the report in a letter written from Paris by a noble Frenchman, Jacques Badavir, which finally determined me to give myself up first to inquire into the principle of the telescope, and then to consider the means by which I might compass the invention of a similar instrument which a little while after I succeeded in doing, through deep study of the theory of refraction, and I prepared a tube, at first of lead, in the ends of which I fitted two glass lenses, both plain on one side, but on the other side one spherically convex and the other concave. Then, bringing my eye to the concave lens, I saw objects satisfactorily large and near, for they appeared one-third of the distance off, and nine times larger than when they were seen with the natural eye alone. I shortly afterwards constructed another telescope with more nicety, which magnified objects more than sixty times. At length, by sparing neither labor nor expense, I succeeded in constructing for myself an instrument so superior that objects seen through it appeared magnified nearly a thousand times and more than thirty times nearer than if I viewed my natural powers of sight alone. It would be altogether a waste of time to enumerate the number and importance of the benefits which this instrument may be expected to confer when used by land or sea, but without paying attention to its use for terrestrial objects, I betook myself to observations of the heavenly bodies. And first of all, I viewed the moon as near as if it were scarcely two semi-diameters of the earth distant. After the moon, I frequently observed other heavenly bodies, both fixed stars and planets, with incredible delight. 
and when I saw their very great number, I began to consider about a method by which I might be able to measure their distances apart, and at length I found one. And here it is fitting that all who intend to turn their attention to observations of this kind should receive certain cautions. For in the first place, it is absolutely necessary for them to prepare a most perfect telescope, one which will show very bright objects distinct and free from any mistiness, and will magnify them at least 400 times, for then it will show them as if only one twentieth of their distance off. For unless the instrument be of such power, it will be in vain to attempt to view all the things which have been seen by me in the heavens, or which will be enumerated hereafter. But in order that any one may be a little more certain about the magnifying power of his instrument, he shall fashion two circles, or two square pieces of paper, one of which is four hundred times greater than the other, but that will be when the diameter of the greater is twenty times the length of the diameter of the other. Then he shall view from a distance simultaneously both surfaces, fixed on the same wall the smaller with one eye applied to the telescope, and the larger with the other eye unassisted. For that may be done without inconvenience at one and the same instant with both eyes open. Then both figures will appear of the same size, if the instrument magnifies objects in the desired proportion. After such an instrument has been prepared, the method of measuring distances remains for inquiry and this we shall accomplish by the following contrivance, shown in the diagram below. For the sake of being more easily understood, I will suppose a tube A, B, C, D. Let E be the eye of the observer. Then, when there are no lenses in the tube, rays from the eye to the object F, G would be drawn in the straight lines, E, C, F, E, D, G. But when the lenses have been inserted, let the rays go in the bent lines, E, C, H, E, D, I, for they are contracted, and those which originally, when unaffected by the lenses, were directed to the object F, G, will include only the part H, I. Hence the ratio of the distance E, H to the line H, I being known, we shall be able to find, by means of a table of signs, the magnitude of the angle subtended at the eye by the object HI, which we shall find to contain only some minutes. But if we fit on the lens CD thin plates of metal, pierced some with larger, others with smaller apertures, by putting on over the lens sometimes one plate, sometimes another as may be necessary, we shall construct at our pleasure different subtending angles of more or fewer minutes, by the help of which we shall be able to measure conveniently the intervals between stars separated by an angular distance of some minutes, within an error of one or two minutes. But let it suffice for the present to have thus slightly touched, and as it were, just put our lips to these matters for on some other opportunity I will publish the theory of this instrument in completeness. Now let me review the observations made by me during the two months just past, again inviting the attention of all who are eager for true philosophy to the beginnings which led to the sight of the most important phenomena. Let me speak first of the surface of the moon, which is turned towards us. For the sake of being understood more easily, I distinguish two parts in it, which I call respectively the brighter and the darker. The brighter part seems to surround and pervade the whole hemisphere, but the darker part, like a sort of cloud, discolors the moon's surface and makes it appear covered with spots. Now these spots, as they are somewhat dark and of considerable size, are plain to everyone and every age has seen them, wherefore I shall call them great or ancient spots to distinguish them from other spots, smaller in size, but so thickly scattered that they sprinkle the whole surface of the moon, but especially the brighter portion of it. These spots have never been observed by anyone before me, and from my observations of them often repeated, I have been led to that opinion which I have expressed, 
namely that I feel sure that the surface of the moon is not perfectly smooth, free from inequalities and exactly spherical, as a large school of philosophers considers with regard to the moon and the other heavenly bodies, but that, on the contrary, it is full of inequalities, uneven, full of hollows and protuberances, just like the surface of the earth itself, which is varied everywhere by lofty mountains and deep valleys. These sketches show the indentation of the terminator and illuminated summits of mountains in the dark part of the moon, the shape of a lunar mountain and of a walled plain. The appearances from which we may gather these conclusions are of the following nature. On the fourth or fifth day after new moon, when the moon presents itself to us with bright horns, the boundary which divides the part in shadow from the enlightened part does not extend continuously in an ellipse, as would happen in the case of a perfectly spherical body, but it is marked out by an irregular, uneven, and very wavy line as represented in the figure given. For several bright excrescences, as they may be called, extend beyond the boundary of light and shadow into the dark part, and on the other hand, pieces of shadow encroach upon the light. Nay, even a great quantity of small blackish spots, altogether separated from the dark part, sprinkle everywhere almost the whole space which is at the time flooded with the sun's light, with the exception of that part alone which is occupied by the great and ancient spots. I have noticed that the small spots just mentioned have this common characteristic always and in every case, that they have the dark part towards the sun's position, and on the side away from the sun they have brighter boundaries, as if they were crowned with shining summits. Now we have an appearance quite similar on the earth about sunrise when we behold the valleys not yet flooded with light but the mountains surrounding them on the side opposite to the sun already ablaze with the splendor of his beams. And just as the shadows in the hollows of the earth diminish in size as the sun rises higher, so also these spots on the moon lose their blackness as the illuminated part grows larger and larger. Again, not only are the boundaries of light and shadow in the moon seem to be uneven and sinuous, but, and this produces still greater astonishment, there appear very many bright points within the darkened portion of the moon, altogether divided and broken off from the illuminated tract, and separated from it by no inconsiderable interval, which, after a little while, gradually increase in size and brightness, and after an hour or two become joined on to the rest of the bright portion, now becomes somewhat larger. But in the meantime, others, one here and another there, shooting up as if growing, are lighted up within the shaded portion, increase in size, and at last are linked on to the same luminous surface, now still more extended. An example of this is given in the same figure. Now, is it not the case on the earth before sunrise, that while the level plain is still in shadow, the peaks of the most lofty mountains are illuminated by the sun's rays? After a little while does not the light spread further, while the middle and larger parts of those mountains are becoming illuminated? And at length, when the sun has risen, do not the illuminated parts of the plains and hills join together? The grandeur, however, of such prominences and depressions in the moon seems to surpass both in magnitude and extent the ruggedness of the earth's surface, as I shall hereafter show. And here I cannot refrain from mentioning what a remarkable spectacle I observed, while the moon was rapidly approaching her first quarter, a representation of which is given in the same illustration placed opposite page 16. A protuberance of the shadow of great size indented the illuminated part in the neighborhood of the lower cusp. And when I had observed this indentation longer, and had seen that it was dark throughout, at length after about two hours, a bright peak began to arise a little below the middle of the depression. This by degrees increased and presented a triangular shape 
but was as yet quite detached and separated from the illuminated surface. Soon around it, three other small points began to shine, until, when the moon was just about to set, that triangular figure, having now extended and widened, began to be connected with the rest of the illuminated part, and, still girt with the three bright peaks already mentioned, suddenly burst into the indentation of shadow like a vast promontory of light. At the ends of the upper and lower cusps also certain bright points, quite away from the rest of the bright part, began to rise out of the shadow, as is seen depicted in the same illustration. In both horns also, but especially in the lower one, there was a great quantity of dark spots, of which those which are nearer the boundary of light and shadow appear larger and darker, but those which are more remote, less dark, and more indistinct. In all cases, however, just as I have mentioned before, the dark portion of the spot faces the position of the sun's illumination, and a brighter edge surrounds the darkened spot on the side away from the sun, and towards the region of the moon in shadow. This part of the surface of the moon, where it is marked with spots like a peacock's tail with its azure eyes, is rendered like those glass vases which, through being plunged while still hot from the kiln into cold water, acquire a crackled and wavy surface, from which circumstance they are commonly called frosted glasses. Now the great spots of the moon observed at the same time are not seen to be at all similarly broken or full of depressions and prominences, but rather to be even and uniform for only here and there some spaces, rather brighter than the rest, crop up, so that if anyone wishes to revive the old opinion of the Pythagoreans, that the moon is another earth, so to say, the brighter portion may very fitly represent the surface of the land, and the darker the expanse of water. Indeed, I have never doubted that if the sphere of the earth were seen from a distance when flooded with the sun's rays, that part of the surface which is land would present itself to view as brighter, and that which is water as darker in comparison. Moreover, the great spots in the moon are seen to be more depressed than the brighter tracks, for in the moon, both when crescent and when waning, on the boundary between the light and shadow, which projects in some places round the greater spots, the adjacent regions are always brighter, as I have noticed in drawing my illustrations, and the edges of the spots referred to are not only more depressed than the brighter parts, but are more even and are not broken by ridges or ruggednesses, but the brighter part stands out most near the spots, so that both before the first quarter and about the third quarter also, around a certain spot in the upper part of the figure, that is, occupying the northern region of the moon. Some vast prominences on the upper and lower sides of it rise to an enormous elevation as the illustrations show. This same spot before the third quarter is seen to be walled round with boundaries of a deeper shade, which just like very lofty mountain summits, appear darker on the side away from the sun, and brighter on the side where they face the sun but in the case of the cavities the opposite happens, for the part of them away from the sun appears brilliant, and that part which lies nearer to the sun dark and in shadow. After a time, when the enlightened portion of the moon's surface has diminished in size, as soon as the whole, or nearly so, of the spot already mentioned is covered with shadow, the brighter ridges of the mountains mount high above the shade, these two appearances are shown in the illustrations which are given. There is one other point which I must on no account forget, which I have noticed and rather wondered at. It is this. The middle of the moon, as it seems, is occupied by a certain cavity larger than all the rest, and in shape, perfectly round. I have looked at this depression near both the first and third quarters and I have represented it as well as I can in the second illustration already given. 
It produces the same appearance as to effects of light and shade as a tract like Bohemia would produce on the earth. If it were shut in on all sides by very lofty mountains arranged on the circumference of a perfect circle, for the tract in the moon is walled in with peaks of such enormous height that the furthest side adjacent to the dark portion of the moon is seen bathed in sunlight before the boundary between light and shade reaches halfway across the circular space. But according to the characteristic property of the rest of the spots, the shaded portion of this too faces the sun, and the bright part is towards the dark side of the moon, which for the third time I advise to be carefully noticed as a most solid proof of the ruggedness and unevenness spread over the whole of the bright region of the moon. Of these spots, moreover, the darkest are always those which are near to the boundary line between the light and the shadow, but those further off appear both smaller in size and less decidedly dark, so that at length, when the moon at opposition becomes full, the darkness of the cavities differs from the brightness of the prominences with a subdued and very slight difference. These phenomena which we have reviewed are observed in the bright tracks of the moon. In the great spots we do not see such differences of depressions and prominences as we are compelled to recognize in the brighter parts, owing to the change of their shapes under different degrees of illumination by the sun's rays according to the manifold variety of the sun's position with regard to the moon. Still, in the great spots there do exist some spaces rather less dark than the rest, as I have noted in the illustrations. But these spaces always have the same appearance, and the depth of their shadow is neither intensified nor diminished. They do appear indeed sometimes a little more shaded, sometimes a little less but the change of color is very slight, according as the sun's rays fall upon them more or less obliquely. And besides, they are joined to the adjacent parts of the spots with a very gradual connection, so that their boundaries mingle and melt into the surrounding region. But it is quite different with the spots which occupy the brighter parts of the moon's surface. For just as if they were precipitous crags with numerous rugged and jagged peaks, they have well-defined boundaries through the sharp contrast of light and shade. Moreover, inside those great spots, certain other tracks are seen brighter than the surrounding region, and some of them very bright indeed. But the appearance of these, as well as of the darker parts, is always the same. There is no change of shape or brightness or depth of shadow, so that it becomes a matter of certainty and beyond doubt that their appearance is owing to real dissimilarity of parts, and not to unevennesses only in their configuration, changing in different ways the shadows of the same parts according to the variations of their illumination by the sun, which really happens in the case of the other smaller spots occupying the brighter portion of the moon. For day by day they change, increase, decrease, or disappear, inasmuch as they derive their origin only from the shadows of prominences. But here I feel that some people may be troubled with grave doubt, and perhaps seized with a difficulty so serious as to compel them to feel uncertain about the conclusion just explained, and supported by so many phenomena. For if that part of the moon's surface which reflects the sun's rays most brightly is full of sinuosities, protuberances, and cavities innumerable, why, when the moon is increasing, does the outer edge which looks toward the west when the moon is waning, the other half circumference towards the east, and at full moon the whole circle, appear not uneven, rugged, and irregular, but perfectly round and circular, as sharply defined as if marked out with a pair of compasses, and without the indentations of any protuberances or cavities. And most remarkably so, because the whole unbroken edge belongs to that part of the moon's surface, which possesses the property of appearing brighter than the rest, which I have said to be throughout full of protuberances and cavities. For not one of the great spots extends quite to the circumference, 
but all of them are seen to be together away from the edge. Of this phenomenon, which affords a handle for such serious doubt, I produce two causes, and so two solutions of the difficulty. The first solution which I offer is this. If the protuberances and cavities in the body of the moon existed only on the edge of the circle that bounds the hemisphere which we see, then the moon might, or rather must, show itself to us with the appearance of a toothed wheel, being bounded with an irregular and uneven circumference. But if, instead of a single set of prominences arranged along the actual circumference only, very many ranges of mountains with their cavities and ruggednesses are set one behind the other along the extreme edge of the moon, and that too not only in the hemisphere which we see, but also in that which is turned away from us, but still near the boundary of the hemisphere, then the eye, viewing them afar off, will not at all be able to detect the differences of prominences and cavities, for the intervals between the mountains situated in the same circle, or in the same chain, are hidden by the jutting forward of other prominences, situated in other ranges, and especially if the eye of the observer is placed in the same line with the tops of the prominences mentioned. So, on the earth, the summits of a number of mountains close together appear situated in one plane, if the spectator is a long way off and standing at the same elevation. So, when the sea is rough, the tops of the waves seem to form one plane, although between the billows there is many a gulf and chasm, so deep that not only the hulls, but even the bulwarks, masts, and sails of stately ships are hidden amongst them. Therefore, as within the moon, as well as round her circumference, there is a manifold arrangement of prominences and cavities, and the eye, regarding them from a great distance, is placed in nearly the same plane with their summits. No one need think it strange that they present themselves to the visual ray which just grazes them as an unbroken line, quite free from unevennesses. To this explanation may be added another. Namely, that there is round the body of the moon, just as round the earth, an envelope of some substance denser than the rest of the ether, which is sufficient to receive and reflect the sun's rays, although it does not possess so much opaqueness as to be able to prevent our seeing through it, especially when it is not illuminated. That envelope, when illuminated by the sun's rays, renders the body of the moon apparently larger than it really is, and would be able to stop our sight from penetrating to the solid body of the moon if its thickness were greater. Now, it is of greater thickness about the circumference of the moon. Greater, I mean, not in actual thickness, but with reference to our sight rays which cut it obliquely, and so it may stop our vision, especially when it is in a state of brightness and may conceal the true circumference of the moon on the side towards the sun. And with that, I think we'll pause in our reading of The Sidereal Messenger by Galileo Galilei. I know this podcast is called Boring Books for Bedtime, but reading those original observations of our moon was pretty cool. If you'd like to read this work and see Galileo's illustrations for yourself, you'll find a link to it on our Goodreads page. Just go to goodreads.com slash boringbooksforbedtime to find a library of every work read on this podcast. I'd also like to mention our Patreon page, where you can support this podcast. Just go to patreon.com slash boringbookspod, where you'll find a number of perks, including downloadable MP3s and, beginning this month, exclusive episodes for subscribers. I hope you'll check it out. Thank you so much for joining me this evening. Until our next boring book, good night.